police officers. What absurd situation have you just happened upon and realized no one called the cops? I used to be a police officer and one night after my late shift, I was driving home and decided to stop for breakfast at Waffle House. As I pulled into the parking lot, which was shared with an auto repair shop, I noticed some people waving at me. I pointed to the back of the lot so I parked my car and turned on my spotlight. Behind the fence at the back of the repair shop, there was a dumpster. And next to it, I could see the feet of a man. Then another homeless man walked out with a bowl and passed right by my car on his way to Waffle House. I walked over to the man, but he didn't respond when I tried to talk to him. I called for help and when the emergency medical team arrived, they found that the man had already passed. To this day, I still don't know how or why he passed away. The homeless man was waiting for me near Waffle House and when I asked him what had happened, he said, He was out cold, so I was pouring water on him to keep him warm. The video from the auto shop showed the man walking and then collapsing next to the dumpster. It wasn't hurt or anything, so it could have been a medical emergency or something else. For 45 minutes, the homeless man kept going back to a water host near Waffle House, filling a bowl with cold faucet water and pouring it on the man because it was a bit chilly outside and they didn't want it to get too cold. Nothing in my entire career ever came close to the strangeness of that night. Is it just me or does something weird always seem to go down at Waffle House? Story 2 I'm not a police officer, I'm a paramedic, but I think this story fits. My partner and I were at our post, which was in the parking lot of a mall with several stores and one bar that was known to be a bit shady. The partner was taking a short nap, it was around 1am, while I was watching a movie on my phone, waiting for a call. After a while, I noticed a few people coming out of the bar and just hanging around in the parking lot. More people came out and they all just stood there. I went back to my movie and 20 minutes later, I saw that the group outside the bar had grown much larger. Nothing strange was happening, but I thought it was odd that they all had been there for so long, so I decided to take a closer look. I woke up my grumpy partner and asked him to drive our ambulance closer to the group. As we approached with their lights on, the group noticed us and started to split up. Some people ran away, and I saw that in the middle of the group, there was a person. My partner and I jumped out and asked what was going on. Someone from the group said, This guy is just hammered. He stumbled out here and fell asleep. I called out to the man on the ground, but he didn't respond. I checked for a pulse, and there wasn't one. They started CPR while my partner got our medical bag and called dispatch. For 30 minutes, people had just stood around looking at this guy, and none of them did anything about it. There wasn't even any noticeable panic. Nobody asked if he needed help or called anyone, and they probably never would have. The man was already cold by the time we reached him, meaning he had been lying there for at least 30 minutes. We did everything we could, but there was no saving him. We took him to the hospital, and he was pronounced departed within 15 minutes of arriving. How hard is it to ask someone if they're okay? Or to call 911? How could not one single person in that group be alarmed by seeing a man sleeping in a parking lot? I've had similar situations happen at least three times while on duty. People just don't seem to care. Story 3 Three weeks after I started my job as a police officer, I was on my way to our off-site property control. I was driving through a residential area to avoid traffic and to get a look at my new patrol area. As I drove past a house, I saw smoke pouring out from under the roof and two men watching from across the street. They pointed at the house as I stopped and said, I think there's a fire. Their think was an understatement. The whole house was filled with smoke and there had been no call for help. These two men were just chatting and not doing anything. I couldn't see any flames, but it was July 10th, a sunny morning, so there was no mistaking a house fire in broad daylight. I called it in and tried to get into the house to check for anyone. I want to make it clear that I had no fire training, but I knew that if there were anyone inside, I wouldn't be much help and would just be another to rescue once the fire department arrived. I got into the backyard by jumping over the hood of a minivan and sliding across it like the Duke brothers from the TV show because there was so much junk everywhere. This action broke a piece of the wooden fence and jammed my radio key button open so everyone could hear me breathing, yelling for anyone and so on. I didn't know at the time that my mic was open. I lay down on the deck and looked through the sliding glass door, but I could only see about four inches above the floor because of the smoke. I kept yelling for anyone, but there was no response. As soon as the fire department arrived, they made a slow entry because the front door had been barricaded. That's when I knew something wasn't right. My suspicions were confirmed when firefighters brought out a family. The father was the last one taken out and the only survivor. Story 4 I'm not in law enforcement anymore, but I worked in it for about 12 years in a big city. When I was a patrol officer, I got a call about someone setting off fireworks in a mall at 2am. These kinds of calls were common, so we would usually go check the area and then clear the call. I checked the parking lot and didn't find anything, but I noticed that the lights were on in one of the businesses in the mall. I won't say which business it was, but it was owned by a well-known local businessman. Anyway, I got out to check and found the front door unlocked. 
which seemed strange. We had a lot of burglaries in that area, so I asked dispatch to call someone from the business. As I was checking the building, I found the owner and several other important people in the back room where there was a poker table set up. One of the guys was sitting down with a pile of coats in his lap, which was really odd, and he was acting like he was in pain. I then asked him what was wrong. He started to cry and moved the coats, revealing that he had a wound. To make a long story short, these guys had a high-stakes poker game every week and someone tried to rob it and things went wrong. The people involved in the game didn't want to call the police and were planning to have a doctor come and treat him secretly. Playing is against the law in the state where I worked, but we honestly wouldn't have cared much. We actually caught the guy who did it, but the district attorney wouldn't prosecute because the guys didn't want to testify or get involved. The guy recovered just fine. One of the guys I interviewed told me that they were robbed of over $30,000. Story 5 There have been so many absurd situations where people didn't call the police or 911, but the most ridiculous one was when my neighbors across the street had a medical emergency with their father-in-law right in their front lawn during a barbecue. The guy's son was having a huge tantrum. He was screaming, Please God, don't take my dad! The other relatives just watched the spectacle, forming a semicircle around the father-in-law. I finally looked out my window, opened it, and shouted to ask if anyone had called 911. I got about 20 blank stares in response, so I called for them. And when the paramedics arrived, the crazy son tried to stop them as they were loading his dad into the ambulance. I had to call the cops for them, too. It seems like common sense isn't really all that common. I can just imagine their conversation from all the panic be like, Hey, call 911. What's the number? Story 6. I started my shift from 4 in the afternoon until midnight by heading straight to get a coffee. It was a beautiful summer day with people all around. I parked my car and saw a man in front of a park bench. I quickly got out of my police car, grabbed my first aid bag, and reported the situation. The man was awake but not really able to respond. It might sound like a scene from a movie, but we were actually doing the blink-if-you-can-hear-me thing to communicate. The emergency medical team finally arrived and took him to the hospital. I later learned that the poor man had a severe medical emergency and was still in a bad state when it found him. The part that frustrates me was seeing the many people walking around who couldn't even take the time to call 911, let alone check if the guy was okay. Story 7 I patrol on a mountain bike in a city that's not too small and not too big. One morning, just after the rush hour, I was riding and spotted a kid standing on the side of the road with no parents around. I stopped to ask him where his parents were, but he just shrugged. I reported it, and a man ran out of some townhomes across the street. He said the boy had been standing there for a few hours and he had been watching him to keep an eye on him. There were other people around, but we never got a call about it. To make a long story short, the boy had wandered out of the room where he and his mom were staying nearby and ended up on the street. The place was a shelter for women. He managed to get past the manager and a court police officer. His mom had passed away three days before, and when he got hungry, he left the room and wandered out to the street. No one even went to check on them. Story 8. Obligatory, not a police officer, but I am an EMT, emergency medical technician. One day, we were waiting at a traffic light on our way back to the station, marking the end of our shift. We saw a man running incredibly fast across a crosswalk, trying to cross before the light turned red, and a woman chasing after him. My partner and I looked at each other and he said, there's going to be an accident. Sure enough, something did happen. We immediately turned on our emergency lights and jumped out of the ambulance. When we reached the woman, she was unconscious. The partner, who's a paramedic, started his assessment while I went to get a backboard, a cervical collar, and called it in to dispatch. She woke up and immediately started screaming about her boyfriend leaving her. She tried to stand up and run after him, but fell. We finally calmed her down, though she wouldn't listen and kept trying to walk. Once we had her in the back of the ambulance and out of the road, into a nearby parking lot, the driver who approached us. By now, firefighters were on the scene, asking what was going on. We explained the situation, and my partner told them we could handle it, so they left, looking confused and a bit uneasy. We talked to the woman for a while, insisting she needed to go to the hospital, but she kept saying she couldn't go and had to find her boyfriend. Meanwhile, the driver was apologizing to me and saying she wanted to help in any way she could. The woman kept refusing to go to the hospital. After we cleaned her up, she asked if we could take her to her boyfriend's house. As an EMT, I can either take you to the hospital or leave you where you are. She refused transport so much that my partner and I told her we couldn't take her anywhere else. Then she got out of the ambulance and asked the driver if she would take her to her boyfriend's house if she didn't call the police. Before we could even radio in that the patient was refusing transport to the hospital, she was driving away in the car. Story 9. Real and current cop here. One morning as I was going home, a frantic lady with several kids in her car waved me down. She told me there was a device planted outside her garage. I asked her to wait somewhere safe while I checked out her place. 
When I got there, I found a fire extinguisher with a Coke bottle duct taped to it. Upon closer inspection, I saw that the Coke bottle was destroyed and probably filled with dry ice. I suspected it might have been a prank by our kids' friends. Another time, I was patrolling a neighborhood I had never been through before. Just by random choice as I passed by, I saw someone run across the roadway. So I chased the guy to a playground where he tried to hide in the sand. He confessed that he was a minister for some small church. He was arrested that night, and when I called the church in the morning, they didn't seem to care. I posted about it on Facebook and linked the public records from the courthouse's proof, and the local news had a field day with the story. Once I was flagged down by a person who seemed to have a medical problem. He claimed he had been taken by aliens and had no identification on him. He was in a panic, so the rescue team checked him out. He told them the same story, but his information didn't show up in the state's motor vehicle department or any of our reports. While he was in the van, another officer arrived with a fingerprint scanner, but we found out that he wasn't in any database we had access to. We assumed he might have just been on something. He gave me an address to tell his family which hospital he would be at and describe the cars in the driveway. It was across town, so I stopped by hours later on my way home. The cars he described were there, but when I knocked on the door, the people had no idea who he was. I described him and everything, but they didn't recognize him. I just left and never saw him again. I had to help the county with calls one night because they had a major incident. I'm not used to taking calls without addresses. One call had directions like, turn right at the barn, go past the rusted truck, etc. I followed the directions to contact a person about a simple theft that occurred at their work or something. I went to the wrong house and interrupted a barbecue at 2am. One night I heard screaming from a parking lot. I saw a man and a woman. I observed for a moment before intervening. The woman was definitely the one who was starting it all, while the male was backing away and telling her to stop, but she was yelling for help and for someone to call the police. Well, here I am. I arrested her for what she did. I guarantee that if people had called the police for her, they would have given me false testimony saying, yeah, she was the one needing help, blah, blah. I'm glad I witnessed it myself. On my way to the jail outside of the city one night, I saw three pickup trucks on the side of the road. I drove closer and was surprised. About five guys stood on the side of the road looking into a ravine. I could have sworn they were doing something bad. I honked my air horn from afar, ready to speed out of there since I had a prisoner who was my responsibility. The guys all walked to the road. I got out but felt like they were respecting me at this point. One guy approached. As he did, I heard cries coming from the ravine. He told me one of their cows had gone loose and fallen into the ravine. It had been there for a few days before they found it. It nodded and blocked traffic while they put the poor animal down. I was called to a hotel to check in a room that was getting frequent and registered guests. The manager had done some googling of the registered person's name. It was a college girl, pleasant looking, well-mannered in a Facebook page with a nice looking family. She had a back page listing for a service and was in college for biology. She drove a brand new Tacoma, TRD mind you. The manager wanted me to remove any other guests in the room. I knocked on the door and she answered. I explained the manager's suspicions. She laughed and said she was from out of town, just visiting a friend, and he had come over a few times to say hi. She allowed me to do a quick look inside her room for guests. When I came out of the bathroom, I noticed she'd closed the door. She said something like, Can you stay and chat a while? I can't remember exactly what she said because this was back in 2013, 2014. I declined and left. I've also been through really terrible scenes. Some of them were on national news. It's not all fun and games, but I live for the happy moments, the fun times in the job, the people whose lives I actually save, the smiles and handshakes. There have been quite a few people who are here because of me. I know if it wasn't me, it would be another cop from my department, but still, it was me, and it makes me smile. Story 10. During my first year as a police officer, I was patrolling an area near a big Midwestern college where there were a lot of group houses. It was a Friday night during a football weekend, so we were keeping a close eye for any parties that might get out of hand. We drove onto a small block with a narrow street, and there we saw something crazy. No fewer than five people were doing drink stands right in the middle of the road at the same time. Several neighbors were watching from their windows with annoyed expressions, but it was clear that none of them had bothered to call us. It was a good thing we showed up when we did because there were several guys who had passed out and needed medical help right away. But that's not the end of the story. Out of the several arrests I made that night for being intoxicated, one of them was the daughter of one of my dad's best friends. They had been roommates at the same college many years ago. That arrest, which wasn't her first, led to her being moved out of the college. Somehow my dad found out that I was the officer who had stopped by and made the arrest. When I went to my parents' house for dinner next week, my dad greeted me by scolding me. Story 11. Not a cop. I was the guy they walked up on. I wasn't doing anything worthy of calling the cops, but I guess it was questionable enough to take a quick detour to. So I'll start by saying I used to live in California. 
and Fresno was one of the places I lived at. This had to be back in 06 or so. At the apartments I lived at, I never really had many issues, but I guess further in at the back of the complex in those buildings, some shady stuff was going on. At least once a month, a police copter was hovering over this place, spotlighting the area, and I never really knew why until much later. I moved into a unit in their sister complex in 08 and got to talking with a head maintenance worker in charge of both places and got the beans spilled. So anyways, the last of those Star Wars prequels had come out on DVD still somewhat recently, and for some reason, one of my buddies thought it would be cool and fun to choreograph lightsaber play, just because we were silly nerds. Figured if we got some moves down, we'd spend some cash and some good prop lightsabers to play with. But we basically used sticks he ordered up. Actually, come to think of it, our first version was a couple dowels and a small 5 inch long or so pipe at the bottom for the handle and counterweight, but those broke quickly, and he found the sticks online that were more durable and meant for what we were planning and holding up. So usually we'd end up doing this. Just about. Playing with these sticks like total nerds and choreographing up those moves we'd follow. We happened to be doing this in a police helicopter night and finally they spotted us with these sticks. Spotlight lands on us. We stop, look up, give a little wave. Spotlight doesn't move. I look at my buddy. He looks at me. I shrug. Don't mind it. We're not doing anything bad. We go back into it. A minute later there came about four or five officers all in tactical gear. They were holding them pretty casually but I guess they got sent to see what we were doing or if they happened to come across something during their call. They asked us what we were doing and saying we were practicing lightsaber moves sounded pretty dumb, so we told them we were practicing for a play. Pretty much dropped it at that. They asked me where a building number was and told us we should probably go inside for the night. And off they went. <laughs> My favorite part of this is that the spotlight landed on them and their first instinct was to wave at the helicopter. Anyways, if you're enjoying the video, don't forget to hit that subscribe and like button for more videos like this. Story 12. Police officer in a very wealthy rural area. People out walking at night is not typically normal. We usually just stop, say hi, and ask if they need anything, then go on our way. One rainy night, I was driving down one of our busier roads, still in the middle of nowhere, and saw a male just running. He was clearly not exercising, so I stopped and asked him if he was okay. I asked if he wanted to ride somewhere so he could get out of the rain. He said he had gone into an argument with his parents and was running to his friend's house. He was acting strange, and it seemed that he was hiding something. I decided it was best to take him where he was going and hopefully speak with an adult who could explain further. He said that was fine and that his friend's parents could explain, so he hops in and we go. Sure enough, I pull into the driveway and look up into the window. I see a group of teenagers. They see my police car and give me the uh-oh look, put down the blinds and start going everywhere. I realized this was a party and said to the kid, Dude, why did you just have me drive you here? He then realized what he had just done and he turned very red. Turns out his argument with his parents was because they didn't want him going to this party and he just ran out of his house. He could have told me to take him home, to Wendy's, anywhere but there, and I would have gladly done it. Story 13. So I'm not a cop, but one time, I was driving home from work after a long day of severe thunderstorms in Kansas City. I was on the highway, lots of traffic in front of me, hardly anyone behind me. Everyone was moving to the right lane and I quickly saw two cars in the shoulder and car parts all over the slow lane. Not a single person even slowed down. I pulled over and checked the car in front. It was empty. I checked the second and the driver was hammered, but otherwise all right. He said it happened ten minutes prior and I was the first to stop, but please don't call the cops. I wasn't interested in his request and called anyway. After I said the driver reported he had no injuries but appeared intoxicated, the 911 dispatcher put me on hold. She came back on, said all first responders were busy with flood rescues and they dispatched police in a tow when they could, and would I stay at the scene. After about 25 minutes sitting there, the driver walked over and asked me if I'd drive him home. I said he'd get a leaving the scene. He just said, Man, if they arrest me for leaving the scene sometime tomorrow, they won't arrest me for DUI. I got my car on my plate. They'll know where to find me. Dude got a ride. I went home. Cops never called back for a follow-up. Story 14. Not a cop, but one experience I had was when my friends and I were driving to Dunkin' Donuts during our lunch period in the Bronx. About two blocks away from school, we see a white sedan and an SUV next to each other, one of them blocking the road and facing the wrong way. I stop and wait because I don't have anywhere to go. Sedan in the wrong lane speeds up, swerves out of the way of my car and parks it up in the spot next to me on the other side of the street. The SUV starts coming down the lane and a guy gets out of the sedan with a baseball bat and hand swings into the speeding SUV's windshield. The SUV continues driving off and the guy gets back in the sedan and chases him down. My friends and I are in total shock and just go straight back to school, skipping the coffee and bagels. 
We go straight to our guidance counselor and tell him what happened, and he just looks at us like, well, did you call the cops? Not for a second did it cross our minds to even look at the license plates. Story 15. Not a cop. Back in my community college days, I went to a Taco Bell across the street in the late morning to review some assignments about an hour before class. I was the only customer during that time, just focused on my work. About 15 minutes later, two huge guys came in to rob the place, dressed very much like you would imagine. I honestly didn't even notice until the lookout started asking me questions about my papers and to stay put. The workers complied, but the safe was on a timer, so we were all stuck in that Taco Bell for about half an hour. During that time, it was getting close to noon and several customers tried to come in, but the lookout, who was a large man, turned away at least a dozen customers saying that the Taco Bell was closed right before noon. A lot of them were extremely upset that they couldn't have their tacos, but didn't think twice that there was something suspicious about a huge dude in street clothes turning them away. Some terrified random kids sitting inside and with no staff in uniform inside with all the doors unlocked. They ended up getting away with whatever money they took. They didn't rob me, thankfully. No one was hurt. I missed class and had to give a statement to some detectives. But hey, I got a free soda out of the whole thing, so... Yay? Story 16. Cop here, and I have two stories I could share. I used to work in a small town for the county sheriff's department. I was coming into town and I saw a car belonging to a guy we'll call Jimmy. Jimmy awkwardly parked on the side of the road. Lights on, the car was running. It was about 1.30 a.m. on a Wednesday, so this was out of the ordinary. I pulled over and approached the car. I could see Jimmy's kids playing in the back seat and I saw Jimmy asleep with an uncovered syringe in the front seat. He was unresponsive, and the kids confirmed my suspicions and this wouldn't be my first interaction with Jimmy. I called medics and gave treatment. He came out of it as EMS arrived. Second story, same small town, about 4 a.m., it's quiet outside and I parked to get out for a quick break. Halfway through, I heard a very loud sound from the empty desert behind me. I turned my flashlight towards the sound and see Carl, a known hammered guy, stuck and passed out in a chola. For those who don't know, a chola is a cactus that is absolutely a pain to get stuck to you. Another deputy and I pulled him out and from his reaction, it seemed painful, he was transported to the hospital by EMS. Two months later, I found him passed away in the same spot. Story 17 one Friday night, around 1 a.m., I was patrolling the streets when I noticed some headlights on a cross street that seemed a bit off. I drove around the block and came up behind the car, and then it became clear that it had been in an accident into the side of a parked semi-trailer. I couldn't see the front of the car yet, so I reported it to dispatch as a property damage accident, thinking there were no injuries and said I would update them with more information. As I walked up to the car, I went around to the front to get a better look at the situation. When I saw the full picture... I realized that the small car had slipped into the trailer. There was so much damage to the car that I couldn't see anything, but I was certain this would be so much more than just an accident. Maybe it was wishful thinking or just routine, but I called out, Police, hello. To my surprise, I heard a man start yelling for help. In short, the guy had been intoxicated and passed out. It wasn't his time because his seat had reclined back and he slid under the trailer. After looking into the incident and checking security cameras, I found out that this happened an hour before I found him on a busy section of the road. Not a single person called it in. Stories like this always make me wonder why side impact guards are not mandatory in the States yet. Story 18. I drove up to an apartment where the fire alarm was going off and there were visible flames from what looked like the kitchen window of one apartment. This was a 16-unit apartment with approximately 40 people in it. There were no emergency personnel on the scene. I asked who had called the fire department and no one answered. I asked again. Someone said, isn't that what the alarm means? I understand that some building fire alarms automatically alert the fire department, but this was not one. Nor should anyone assume emergency vehicles are on the way just because the alarm is going off. People had been watching the fire for at least five minutes and just talked about the fire department not being there. The station was one mile away. I called the fire department and they were there in three minutes. Another time was when an NFL game had just ended at 10 p.m. Traffic was a nightmare. As I'm approaching a major intersection, I notice that lanes are moving together, which is odd because all the traffic was moving in the direction of the interstate. Thought maybe it was an accident and people stopped in the lane. Can't see though, so I figured someone would call it if it was an emergency. Finally pull up to the intersection to find an old lady in yellow rain boots and a pink fuzzy hat directing traffic and screaming at cars as they passed. Nobody called it in. Story 19. So there I am in my patrol car. I just started my shift. This was the night after my baby boy was born, and boy was I a proud father. Right as I got in my cruiser that night, I taped a picture of my wife with him in her arms right on my dashboard so I could look at them. On with the story, though. 
I turned down this road the local town liked to call Abandonville. It was a single road that happened to have a ton of old abandoned industrial buildings. I usually try and swing by since odd stuff is always happening in places like that. I get all the way to the end of the street where it starts to reintegrate with the rest of the city. That's when I saw this huge man committing a crime. Across the road, there was a diner and people were staring at this happen. No one called the police. I jumped out of my squad car and started running at him. Story 20. I remember one time when I was walking to the local shops to get some food, and a very agitated man came around the corner. He raised his hands and said, Fine then. Here I am. Arrest me. I know that's what you'll do. That's what you always do. Quick, boss. Cuff me before I do something stupid. Arrest me. I was confused and looked around to see if there were any other people involved or any clue as to what I had done. I made sure my radio was on in case I just missed a job or one was about to be announced, but nothing came through. I thought, why not just go along with it? So I handcuffed him and told him he was under arrest and asked him what he was being arrested for. He looked puzzled and asked, Didn't someone call you? I replied, No, I'm here to get some lunch. He suddenly looked quite annoyed with himself. Well, what are you arresting me for? I said, You told me to. Do you not want to be arrested? He responded, Well, I don't know. Geez, um... Finally, someone else came around the corner and figured out that he had a heated argument with his partner at the shops and walked off thinking the police would be called. He also thought he would be arrested for breaching a restraining order against the woman, except there wasn't one. He had just been trespassed from her house after the last incident and he didn't know the difference. I got another police unit to give him a ride out of the area and he was quite grateful. Thanks for letting me go, boss. I said, well, I had nothing to arrest you for. You arrested yourself. Story 21 I'm a security guard, not a police officer, but I have a story about the bystander effect. I work at a shopping mall in a decent part of town. Not the rich area, but not bad either. The place where I work has a bar that's themed like an Irish pub, and on St. Patrick's Day, they get a huge crowd, even though the only Irish thing about the place is the name. Last year on St. Patrick's Day, the bar was expecting a big crowd, so they called in their whole security team, which included eight big guys wearing green shirts. I don't work for the bar. I work for the owner of the property, so their crowd is their responsibility, and everything else in the lot is mine. Even though I'm not their security, I'm friendly with some of their bouncers, and we share information about people we should watch out for. I was on duty, and part of my job is to stand at the opposite end of the lot from the bar for about 20 minutes to keep an eye on the business there. Remember, the bar isn't my job, it's the bouncers. When it was time for my patrol, I walked around and passed by the long line outside the bar to check my spots, one of which is near their entrance. The guys at the door gave me strange looks as I passed by, but no one said anything, and I thought they were just busy with the crowd. I went around the corner past the bar to a smaller parking area, where they had set up two portable toilets for the customers. One of their bouncers was there, and when he saw me, he came over and said he had a problem and didn't know what to do, so he asked for my help. I'm the kind of person who can't say no when someone asks for help, so I asked what was going on. He told me they had removed one of their customers after finding him being on something in the bar. The guy had been running around outside near the line in the bathrooms for 15 minutes before locking himself in a portable toilet. I asked if they called the police, and he said yes, someone had. Then we heard noises from inside the portable toilet, so I went and knocked on the door to ask if the guy was okay. His speech was so slurred that I could only understand a few words, but seconds later the door opened and the guy came out. I asked if he was okay and who he was there with, but I couldn't understand anything else he said. I told him to sit down and wait, but he just started walking in circles around the lot, talking nonsense. Another bouncer came over, so I asked him when they had called the police so I could figure out when they might arrive. He said straight out that none of them had called the police because they thought I would find the guy soon enough, and no one in their crowd had called the police, even though there were easily a hundred or so people out there. I called the police right away. It only took a few minutes for them to respond because there were already patrols out looking for intoxicated drivers. They also sent an ambulance. I'm not sure what happened after they took the guy away because my boss told me to get back on patrol once the police and ambulance had him, but I was pretty upset with the bar security team after that. Story 22. I was driving home at the end of my shift when I saw a low-priority call appear on my in-car computer. It was for a woman who had called because there was a strange car parked in front of her house. It was around 1am. I decided to stop by and check it out. When I arrived, I found the car wasn't just parked. It had been in an accident into a tree in her yard and all the doors in the trunk were open. There was no one around. I checked the license plate and was standing in the street when I heard a voice say, Excuse me, sir. Can you help me? A guy walked out of the shadows between two houses across the street. 
I checked him and discovered he'd been in another accident. He was still awake, but wouldn't tell me who did this to him or what was happening. It stayed a mystery for about the next 20 minutes until another police unit in the area stopped a guy walking down the street with a carburetor. He said he was just waiting for a ride, but he had the same last name as the registered owner of the car, so he was detained. After listening to a long story full of lies and tracking down some of the other people involved, we got a rough idea of what had happened. It turned out the car was being driven by the guy with the carburetor, who was a member of the local group, had been speeding through a neighborhood controlled by a different group. That group got into a car and chased him, which led him into the woman's front yard. The guy with the carburetor and his friend ran away on foot, but he remembered there was a valuable carburetor in the trunk, so he went back to get it. By then, the other group was there and they robbed him of his sunglasses. They gave them his sunglasses but kept the carburetor. Story 23. Obligatory not a police officer, but this happened to me. I had worked a Saturday shift and a colleague offered me a ride home. I said no at first, thinking I'd be fine taking the bus, but she insisted. We got into her car and started chatting. She drove about 60 feet down the road and then began making a strange noise. I asked if she was okay, but she didn't really respond. She drove through a red light, turned a corner and then pulled over, still making odd noises and not answering me. I managed to open my door and a woman came over and said, You just went through a red light. Oh my God. I said, Yeah, sorry. But the woman just walked away, completely ignoring the situation and the fact that I was upset and my friend was seriously ill. I realized something was very wrong, so I called emergency services. I thought my colleague might be having heart problems, but it turned out she was having a medical emergency right in front of me. The whole time I was on the phone waiting for the ambulance, we were parked in front of a busy store with people standing there watching. Not one person came over to help or even called for help. It was very clear that something serious was happening, and the only time anyone came close was when she was being put into the ambulance. And even then, they were just there to stare. I followed the ambulance in her car to the hospital, and as I did, I gave the people who were watching a hand gesture to show how upset I was with them. I spent five hours at the hospital with her until her family could get there from the other side of the country. She survived, but she'll never be the same. I now refuse to shop at that store. The owner was one of the people who just watched. It makes me shiver to think that if she had been alone, no one would have done anything, and she probably would have ended right there. Story 24. Not a police officer, but I have a story to share. I was walking down the street in Memphis on a really hot day. It was 90 degrees and there was an ozone warning. This meant that the layer of ozone in the atmosphere was very thin, which made the heat feel even worse. It turned a 90 degree day into what felt like 120 degrees. Memphis even has a program where you can ride buses for just a quarter in ozone days to help keep some of the homeless population from getting too hot. It's that serious. The only reason I was out in the heat was to buy supplies to make my partner a birthday cake. It was his birthday, and I'd waited until the last minute to do it. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been outside in that heat for anything. I was walking through a residential neighborhood when I heard a strange noise, like a lot of cats meowing. I couldn't figure out what it was, but I thought it wasn't a big deal, so I kept walking. The noise got louder, and I thought maybe I should cross the street, so against my better judgment, I did. As I crossed the street, I saw two little blonde kids. I asked them where their parents were, and the kids were completely hysterical. They were screaming, but I couldn't understand what they were saying. I walked around trying to find a parent and saw a woman in a front porch. She told me to call 911, and I called them as fast as I could. It turned out she had been there for four hours, and her kids had been trying to get the attention of anyone walking by to find their mom, but no one had stopped to help. Hundreds of cars had driven by, and nothing was done. The paramedic said if she had been out there for another hour, she would have passed away. It was crazy. I have no idea what happened to her. She tried to explain it to me, but her words didn't make any sense. I never found out what happened to her after the ambulance took her away. I just hope the kids were okay and that the mom was okay too. Well, if you like these stories, here's more. YouTube thinks you're going to love this. Catch you in that video.